sacrament with you today. And it will be a, a blessed experience to be able to come to the altar today and commune. Being here at the altar reminds us that there are two fellowship directions that we have today. One is heavenward. We're communing with our Lord Jesus. He is the host and the food for this meal. But there is also the horizontal fellowship 
Amen. Amen. We sing the hymn, Chief of Sinners, Though I Be. We sing verses 1 through 5. The first reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 22, the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. 
Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, yet did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to an Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who you appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's response to Psalm is Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord my God, I called you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called to the Lord. I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it, pro will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. That my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of Revelation, verses 8 through 14. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. We sing the sermon hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we consider the Holy Gospel lesson under the theme, What is Your Net Worth? We like to flatter ourselves sometimes with the boast that we would have done a better job at following Jesus than the first disciples. Would we have been quicker to believe the promises of Jesus than the disciples were? They saw some awesome miracles on the part of Jesus. They saw the feeding of the 5,000 and how there were even leftovers that they could take in baskets for eating later. And yet when the disciples, after that miracle, were crossing the Sea of Galilee, they questioned whether they would have enough to eat. And we say, oh, we would have done better than they did. The disciples, as the arrest of Jesus drew near, the disciples all thought that they would be following Jesus no matter what. It wasn't just Peter who said, though everyone else deny you, I will never deny you, Jesus. I'm sure the other disciples thought that they would stick close to Jesus, but what did they do? They ended up forsaking Jesus and fleeing. And in their own way, they denied Jesus just as surely as Peter did. And we look at today's story and we see the disciples returning to fishing. Now, how could they do that? Jesus was risen from the dead. Didn't they know that they now had work to do for him? Weren't they anticipating the coming of the kingdom? Maybe we do wrong today when we point the finger at the disciples and say they were faithless in returning to fishing. What is your net worth? Was the disciples' net to catch regular fish, was it worth anything? Is our daily calling worth anything? Now, how many of you on a daily basis are handling a fishing pole or a net? I don't think we have any fishermen here in the congregation today, do we? But if you had to pick some physical thing to be a symbol of what you do on a daily basis, what would it be? Would it be your computer? What is your computer worth? Or what if you're a cashier at the local supermarket? Then you would say, well, what is your cash register worth? Let's say you're a farmer. You drive a tractor on a daily basis. You have a harrow. You have a planter. What what are those things worth? Well, we have to ask, what are those things worth? What is your net worth without Jesus? Now, we know Jesus appeared there at the Sea of Galilee, right? Right? But what if Jesus had not come to the shore that day? The disciples were fishing, right? All night they had fished. But what were their nets worth? They were worth nothing because all night, though they had labored with all the skill and with all the knowledge they had from years of fishing, I ask you, what had they caught? They had caught nothing. What is your computer worth without Jesus? Nothing. 
What is your tractor or harrow or planter worth without Jesus? What is that cash register where you check out customers? What is that worth without Jesus? It's worth nothing. Didn't Solomon, years and years before this, a thousand years before Jesus, didn't he say that all the striving, all the labor that we do here on this earth without any reference to God all of that labor we do under the sun without God is what? A chasing after the wind. It is a striving for nothing. Jesus had, had said the same thing when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain connected to me, if you abide in me by word and prayer... You will bear what? Much fruit. But then Jesus added, apart from me, you can do nothing. So I don't think Jesus is saying it's bad to go fishing. But he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. How many fish did the disciples catch that night? Does it seem strange to you that, that the Apostle John, in recording this gospel, would write down the actual number of fish? I guess it always seems strange to me, too, until I was on my first call in the ministry to Bay City in Palacios, Texas. We had friends in the congregation in Palacios named Barney and Judy, and they liked to fish, and they got my wife Robin and I interested in fishing along the Colorado River, which empties into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, we would go fishing at night under the lights, and I've never had any kind of fishing as exciting as that under the lights. We would have two hooks at the end of our line, and the, the speckled trout, the sea trout, were running so thick that you could catch two fish at one time. Well, the lady who owned the pier where we fished on the Matagorda River was named Virgie. And Virgie had one requirement for everyone who fished under the lights. At the end of the night, there was a blackboard, and you had to record on that blackboard the exact number of fish which you had caught. And so we would write down, I don't know if we ever caught 153 fish in one night, but it is not so strange for fishermen to boast about the number of fish or the size of the fish. Have you ever heard, you know, you catch a fish like this, and then in the telling of the story, what happens to the size of that fish? It, you know, by the end of the day, that fish is this big. Your daily calling is important. And Jesus wants to help you in that. He will give you an abundance of resources to serve God in whatever capacity you have to do your work. Is the work you do Monday through Friday pleasing to God? If you do it with faith in Christ, to the glory of God, and for the benefit of your neighbor, it is a God-pleasing work. Doesn't that make you feel better about going to work on Monday morning? That's part of your calling. And why does God give you and me daily labor? Number one, so that we can support our own families. Yes, God gives us daily bread. And how does he often do that? He does it by giving us a job to do. The work that you have to do is a good thing. It doesn't matter what it is so much as how you do it, the attitude you have. Do you do it with faith 
in Christ? Does his love motivate you to love your neighbor and to serve your neighbor in the work you do? Does your faith move you and motivate you to do it to the glory of God? Then it is a good thing. But was this from now on going to be the only work of the disciples to go fishing for perch or trout or flounder? Was that their only work? What else were they supposed to do in life? You cannot find your total purpose in life just in the work you do Monday through Friday. God wants all of us, even as Jesus wanted the 12 disciples and now the 11, Paul would become the 12th disciple. Jesus had other work for them to do, and that became clear already when Jesus called Peter, James, and John. Remember another night they had spent in futile labor on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus showed up that morning too, earlier, much earlier than this episode in John's Gospel. Jesus had shown up that morning, and after a night of casting their nets and pulling them in, what had they caught? Again, without him helping them, they had caught nothing. But Jesus bids them to go out into the deep water and cast their nets again. We don't have the exact number of fish they caught the first time, but they caught so many that their nets were about to break. Their boats were about to sink. And when Peter got to land, because of the miraculous catch of fish, he recognized who Jesus is. He recognized that Jesus is more than a mere man. He recognized that Jesus is God. And if we were to be brought into the presence of Jesus this morning, I bet that one of the first things we would say to Jesus is the same thing that Peter said What did he say when he got to land and knelt at the feet of Jesus? He said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. What did Jesus say to Peter? What was Jesus' very first word to Peter? Don't be afraid. Jesus is saying that to you today. Don't be afraid. Do you realize the full import of those words? Don't be afraid. Jesus saying don't be afraid is tantamount to his saying, your sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus was saying to Peter Peter realized his deepest need. He said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. And Then he gave the disciples, along with Peter, the next step in their journey. They were to follow him, and they were to learn how to become what? Fishers of people. God wants to gather all people to himself. Now, what happens when you catch a fish, either on a hook or in a net, and you bring it into the boat? What will ultimately happen to that fish if you do not release it? It will die. But what happens when we, as the church, become fishers of people when they are brought into the boat, which is the church. Do they die? No, they find life. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you know where you're sitting right now? This is called the chancel up here, and... 
The fancy term for the lobby out here is the narthex, but where are you sitting right now? The nave. Do you know where that word nave comes from? It comes from the Latin word for ship, navis, N-A-V-I-S. What do you do when you're on the water charting a course? You navigate. We're in the nave of the church. And people need to be brought into the nave, to be brought into fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the chief thing that we share here today? What is everything in the service geared to bring across in terms of a message? We began with what? After we sang, Change My Heart, O God we shared what blessing of God? The forgiveness of our sins. Don't be afraid. Jesus loves you. He's not holding your sins against you. You don't have to carry the guilt of the past and all your failures. Don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. And and when you come here to the altar today, to receive the body and blood of Christ with the bread and wine. What is Jesus really saying to you? Don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. And some of you may be saying today, well, I want to be a fisher of people, but I don't know if I can do it. Well, here are two things you can hold on to today. Number one, you are loved. Perfect love casts out fear. If somebody without Jesus Christ is heading to hell, and we believe they are, what could you possibly do that could make life any worse for them? Nothing. If you share the love of Christ with them in word and deed, then you can't help but be a blessing to them. We listen to others first and hear their story, and then, and only then, after we've earned the right to speak, do we share the good news of Jesus, that Jesus loves them. I drive a a school van in the mornings, And one of the little boys in the van said to me on Friday, Mr. Ray, do you teach people? I don't know why he said that, because I I guess I try to answer the questions that they ask on a regular basis. He said, do you teach people? And I said, well, in the church, I've I've taught kindergartners and I've taught adults. Yes, I, I like to do that. And he said... I'd like to go to church. God will provide the opportunity. We don't have to be the the smartest and the cleverest people in the world, but God will provide the opportunity. And at the critical time, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will give us the very words to speak. So I've used the word net in two ways today. First, it's your daily calling. Second, it's our mission as the church. What is your net worth? You know, if we don't cast the net out there in the world, are we going to catch any fish? Are we going to bring any people here to this place to meet Jesus Christ? No, if we're not casting the net, you can't catch anything. If you don't throw the bait into the water, you're not going to catch a fish. But here, the final thing is, our net would be worth nothing if we're bringing the people into the church and they're doing what? Going out the back door. So when they're brought into the church, we have to do what Jesus told Peter to do. Peter had denied Jesus how many times? Three, how many times has Jesus reinstated him to the ministry here in our gospel lesson? Three times. He says, Peter, do you love me? 
Peter, do you really love me? Peter, are you sure you love me? And then Jesus gives him a task. He says, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. How many of you want Emmanuel Church to be a growing church? There's one thing that I see in all growing churches, and you know what it is? People are in Bible study. Unless the fellowship hall is one day filled again with adults in study, you will not grow here as a church. Unless we're on our knees, we will not be growing as a church. We emphasize the training of children, and that is a very good thing. We need, to, we need to feed the lambs, but adults need the scripture too. Isn't there something great about studying the catechism when you're an adult versus when you're, in a, chi when you're a child? The part of the catechism where we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, and the, the second article's meaning is this, I believe that Jesus has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, that he has redeemed me not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, that I may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. I don't know how much that meant to me when I was 12 years old. But now that I'm 66, I can tell you it means a whole heck of a lot more. And the more we study the catechism and the scripture, now as an adult, the more it will mean to us. So I ask you again the question I ask you at the beginning of this service what is your net worth? <laughs> your net, your daily calling is worth everything because you are serving not just people and not just yourself, but you are serving the Lord Christ. I ask you, what is our net worth as a church? It's worth everything to the world because we have been tasked by Jesus to become fishers of people. And what is our net worth here as a church? It's worth everything because once we bring people here to the church by the power of the Holy Spirit, not our own, then we can, in that same power of the Holy Spirit, feed one another as sheep of Christ. We can tend the lambs that Jesus gives us. What is your net worth? It is worth everything to the Lord Jesus. Don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith, which is in Christ, to life everlasting. Amen. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Let us rise. I believe, I believe in, one in one God, God the, Father the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. 
whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ lives and reigns as the victorious Lamb of God. Let us bring him our prayers so that he may present them before the one who is seated on the throne in heaven. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for appearing to your disciples after your resurrection and for rescuing them from guilt and shame. Turn those who persecute you like Saul and restore those who deny you like Peter. Remind us today and every day of the dual purpose you have given us as your church, to be fishers of people bringing them into your church, and then feeding them with your life-giving word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless your entire flock, the Holy Christian Church, as it pursues your mission. Provide strength and wisdom to all pastors and teachers, especially we pray for the next pastor whom you have chosen to lead Emmanuel Congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for blessing us with the changing seasons and for rain and sunshine to make the crops grow. Continue to water the earth and protect it from fire, flood, disease, and famine. Bring aid and comfort to those in Kansas who lost their homes in the tornadoes or those who are suffering from the wildfires out west. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring peace to those suffering the ravages of war in Ukraine. Bless our world with peacemakers who can show the way out of this terrible conflict. Watch over the men and women of our nation's military who are standing against tyranny and are ready to make any sacrifice to defend our freedom. Especially, we lift up Phil... Colin, Dash, John, Corey, Kyle, Scott, Tori, and Matt, Ryan, Noah, Joseph, Faustine, and Joshua, and Mason. Guide and direct all our own leaders that the United States may truly be a land with liberty and justice for all. Help us to make the best possible use of all the resources you have given our country, that ours may be a good and fruitful home for people and for all living things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you choose as your own the sick and the sad, the lost and the lonely. Especially, we pray today for those who have been ill or gone through surgery. We lift up Audra and John, Earl, Nancy, Linda, Brenna and her family, Tom Harmon, Bill, Rada, Lynn, Pastor Kreft, Quincy, Caitlin, Fran, Kim Culver, and Ben Culver. And be with those, Lord, whose way has been difficult for a very long time, Anna Mildenberger, Pat Rowe, Betty Keeney, Mark, Ruth Decker, Sandy Richter, Donna Kopp, Mary, Carol Chisholm, Cheryl, Sherry Taylor, Peter, Nadine Culver, Lewis Powell, and Sarah. Show us how to share each other's pain so that we may feed those who hunger for comfort and consolation. May your Holy Spirit come alongside the shut-ins of our congregation, Hilda Nye, Ruth Ashey, and Bill and Lois Yeager. We turn to you 
the God of all comfort, for you are able to comfort us in all our troubles. Dry the tears and increase the hope of those who have lost loved ones, especially Virginia and her family on the death of her grandson, the Ball family on the death of their father, and Walt and Marie on the death of their son Kyle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the miracle of baptism, wherein our old sinful natures are drowned and die, and we are given new natures to rise with you and walk in newness of life. Especially, we thank you today for giving this blessing of new life to Ashley, to Cindy, to Millard, to Denise, and to Beth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Meet the needs of those in special need in our community, as well as those we personally know to be in want, and whom we now name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, whenever we are discouraged in our work and in our lives of, that are so sinful, rescue us. Renew us through your means of grace. Remind us that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to love and serve you to our life's end and finally come with all your saints to worship you in heaven. For to you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As Christians, we confess that we sinners are worthy to commune because Jesus welcomes sinners who repent of their sins and believe his promise that he gave his life and shed his blood for their forgiveness. We are to examine ourselves in light of God's word to see whether we are properly prepared to receive what he offers us. Are you aware of your sins and are sorry for them? I am. Do you believe in our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in his words in the sacrament? I do. Do you intend, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to live as a forgiven sinner, resisting the devil, saying no to sinful desires, and walking in the newness of life? I do. Then come to receive the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ offered for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins, for eternal life, and for salvation. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the Passover supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our closing hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns. <laughs>